it's both an honor and a bit daunting uh, for me to be here questioning the great questioner, the great interrogator himself, uh, Marcel Ophuls. Um, just to establish something of your your background and the special circumstances that I think uh, uh, made for your unique perspective, I thought we would um, go through some of the basic biographical information uh, uh, of your childhood and upbringing. Um, you, you don't have to lie down, you can sit up, it's fine. Um, <laughs> No, no, I can do a, go through the hop of Marx thing in the night at the opera, you know, yes. drinking water while you speak. Oh, I speak. Um, <laughs> you were born in 1927 and um, born in Germany, in fact. Uh, and um, uh, I think of you as somebody who is uh, a citizen of, of at least three countries, uh, Germany, France, and the United States, having spent your first six years in Germany and then um, uh, your family left uh, uh, when Hitler took over and went to France uh, and then uh, stayed there for about seven years till 1940 and then moved to... 41. The United, 41. And then moved to the United States. It's important because if we'd come over in 40, my father would have been a draft dodger ah. in France, which he wasn't. I mean, we didn't come over before the war. We came after the defeat. After the defeat. So it, that's politically important. Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, the, what, uh, you were, of course, the, uh, uh, your father was a great uh, director, Max Ophels. Um, we may disagree on some things tonight, but we agree on that. We agree on that. No, to me, he is uh, one of the ten greatest directors who ever lived. Right. Uh, uh, made movies such as uh, Liebelei and um, uh, The Rings of Madame D and uh, La Ronde uh, and uh, Letter from an Unknown Woman, another favorite of mine, um, and uh, was identified, has become identified with a certain kind of um, um, rom romantic uh, in obsession or involvement, uh, uh, someone who uh, had, a, had a very worldly wise uh, gently pessimistic, you could say, um, take on the world. Uh, famous also for his formal, for the formal beauty of his movies, the, the wonderful tracking shots, the sense of, of fluidity. Uh, things are always moving, but uh, even if they're moving in a direction of sadness, they're always moving. Um, you used the word pessimist a minute ago, yeah. and just before that, you talked about romantic. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say I think that my that my father was able to make what at, in his time were known as women's pictures. Yes. Men were not supposed to see them <laughs> because he was not a romantic. Because he was, he always had this thing that 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 if you're going to talk about, it, that if you're going to show passion, and if you're going to show feeling, which is really what art is supposed to be about. Um, you have to you have to be like a captain on a sail on a sailing boat. You have to uh, sentiment being being the wind, mm. and you have to sail as close to the wind as you can. And if you go into sentimentality, then the, then then the sailboat uh, capsizes. capsizes. Right. Well, he was one of those directors who for whom uh, uh, women were uh, were at the center of his vision. You think of. Uh, uh, other directors like uh, uh, Mizuguchi and maybe Ingmar yes, Bergman. Yes. Um, who More are, Mizuguchi than Bergman because Bergman, I think, is a is a conscious feminist. He is like Antonioni. They are they, they are militant feminists. Right. My father was not a militant feminist. As a matter of fact, he, he, he profited from women, but he and he, he saw his own times as it is. I, I think he was very much a realist, like Chekhov was. It's yeah. Anyway, you were saying something about pessimism. Uh, one of the things he said is that he couldn't possibly imagine, he couldn't find any example in literature, in great literature, of any writer he admired who had ever been an optimist. 
we were talking about uh, about this earlier in the evening, and I maintain that on some level, he he was an optimist because at least his characters uh, uh, finally were touched by love, even if they died in the process. Uh, so <laughs> you could say, in that sense, a cautious. Um, but did you did you did you have any of this sense when you were growing up that your that your childhood or your life was at all like a Max Ophel's movie? Did it feel? Did it have any of this uh, uh, gaiety, this gravity, this sense of uh, um, uh, Viennese um, elegance? Sure, he was manic depressive. Uh, <laughs> he was? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, it, 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 he didn't talk for days. And, uh, and then when he would start talking, then we would start having fun. And, and uh, I, I, uh, what I miss most uh, since he died many, many years ago. Uh, is, is, is the laughter where, where he was he was able to uh, have him the tears streaming down my face other people's faces uh, because he was so funny and in several languages huh. it was very very funny man. <laughs> um, well we want to uh, look at the uh, at a uh, a clip from one of his movies, um, but before we get to that, uh, just uh, you, you spent those years in France when you were, I think, between the ages of, uh, oh, I don't know, 6 and 12 or 13, right? That's right. And then you came to, uh, to the United States where your father um, uh, sought work um, in uh, Hollywood, um, and uh, not always successfully, I gather. There's that Bert Brecht poem, how does it go about? Going to the marketplace in Hollywood is famous poem about. Yes, he was out of work for four years because because we did come in forty one and not in 19, not not when the war started and by that time the Jewish the German Jewish quota and the French Jewish quota and the refugee quota was filled in the major studios. Yes. So uh, <laughs> so he was uh, in spite of the the great solidarity which you know about because I think you're writing about it uh, between the uh, uh, refugees who tried to help each other including bringing the groceries over the weekend we were sort of a golden welfare uh, deadbeats you know well he had to and, he had to learn the American way just as you no, did no no it wasn't that uh, I don't think so uh, no more than the others, no more than yeah. Billy Wilder and, and the ones who came over earlier. We, we all had to learn the American way, but we also uh, middle European people who people whose whose inspiration came from Berlin and the Weimar Republic. In fact, as we know from examples like Billy Wilder and Lubitsch, uh, adapted extremely well. Right. The, 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 it was a very good mix. And yes. It was a very rich mix for American culture in the 20th century. And it was it usually worked pretty fast. No, it was just that uh, that you're, we came in the middle of war, and there were a lot of other refugees. And my father at that time did not have the same kind of reputation that Fritz Lang or Jean Renoir had, and so he had to wait his turn. It was as, as what was it like? That. What was it like for you um, when you lonely? First yeah, lonely, because Los Angeles, as you know, is a town where you, uh, you, first of all you have to be, uh, you have to wait till you're 16 to get a driver's license, and you can't really see any friends because everything's very far apart. And also, I was um, very, I loved Paris, and and and, and um, Paris was occupied, and there was the war was on, and so I was a wallflower, and I didn't play football, so I decided to become a French snob. I decided. <laughs> I decided that Hollywood High School was um, was the dumps, which in many ways it was, and um, and then I, I decided to despise it all. The idea of you uh, as a graduate of Hollywood High School boggles the mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. No, well, later when I when I got into the American Army, then I started uh, then I started uh, latching on to. Uh, popular culture and, and, and jazz and Fats Waller because my best friend was Hal Greenberg who was a, from Brooklyn and was a piano player and who 
who was playing piano without Tatum and then in Tokyo we played in nightclubs and we had a wonderful time doing occupation duty in Japan and then I became I'm not a militarist but I was very happy in the American army yeah. I think I discovered I discovered this country in the American army it was a much more interesting mix than, than Hollywood high school okay. Hollywood high school was repressive did you did you have any <laughs> famous classmates? Uh, oh, you want to hear about Marilyn Monroe? Yes. <laughs> Wait, no, I heard that Ricky Nelson when it was going. There oh, really? At the time you were. Yeah. No, well, uh, Norma Jean Baker is supposed to have been there, but I've looked through a lot of old annuals and I couldn't find her. It was a very big place, anyway. And as I say, I had a very bad attendance record, and so did she. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> So you, so uh, after you got out of um, out of Hollywood High, you went directly into the army then, or you went to college right then? No, I went into the army, and it was already the peacetime army, but uh, uh, legally speaking, it was still wartime. So that I could, uh, then I had the privilege of of uh, studying for four years on the GI Bill of Rights, which was lucky because my father certainly wouldn't have paid for my studies. Uh -huh. He didn't think that in college was was worth anything unless you were going to study medicine or engineering or something like that. He didn't believe that, uh, that um, he felt that you could, that philosophy was like dancing. You should pick it up on your own. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't believe in a liberal arts education. No, he didn't. <laughs> yeah. And he was very Prussian. And did you have any ambition at that time? Yeah, sure, sure. I want to get into films. Really? Oh yes, as soon as I wanted, I had two ambitions. I wanted to get back to Paris as soon as I could, and I wanted to get into films. And my father made me become an American citizen because he said, you know, Europe is a very uncertain proposition. One day you may have anti-Semitism again, and then you'll be happy. Also, by the time you retire, you might get some social security <laughs> from the United right. States. No. So, um, in order to go back to France uh, and just paying my way back to France, I became an American citizen and I took the oath of allegiance. So now I have those two passports you were talking about, my nationality. Yes. I am not, even though I am born in Germany, I do not consider myself a German citizen. I'm, I have nothing against them, but I'm not, you know. You can't, have dual citizenship? Can't throw us out twice. That's right. <laughs> You, you have dual citizenship now. Yes. Huh. Uh, so, so then you you got out of the uh, out of the army and um, you you had studied what in college? Uh, philosophy. Philosophy. Um, John Dewey and William James. Pragmatism. Pragmatism. Yeah. And then, uh, did you did you want to get into uh, movies right then? Did you try to get into movies then? Yes. As a matter of fact, there was a. Uh, uh, director who was working at MGM was a great friend of my father. Uh, you know because you're a movie buff, a man called Curtis Bernhardt. Oh, yes. Quite a, quite a good movie. Right. Good very movie. good. You look at his movies now yeah, and they're very good. stylish. Yeah. You know? He said, what do you want to go to college for? He had the same attitude my father did. He said, I'll take you on the MGM lot tomorrow. You can be, you know, nepotism. You can be my Absolutely. assistant. Yeah. Jewish nepotism. Yeah. And uh, I've always regretted not doing it. MGM is really much better than documentary filmmaking. <laughs> well, wait, did you go on to the... I, I'm afraid you... Did you go on to the, um, onto the set and did you work for him or no? You turned him down? Curtis Bernhardt? Yeah. Well, turn him down is a very hard word for it. <laughs> no, uh, my mother, who was very German Hausfrau and uh, respectable and so on, she thought I should be doing some studying and at that time I wanted to oh. do that too. Oh, I see. But I sort of regretted it. So then what happened? <laughs> so then what happened? Uh, well, uh, I, I went back to study at the Sorbonne, found out that I didn't really enjoy what passed for French philosophy at that time at all, and I really was influenced by my American education, by American pragmatism and Anglo-Saxon attitudes. And uh, dropped out and went to the Champs Elysees and, and uh, started working as an assistant director for people like uh, Duvivier and John Huston and Moulin Rouge and um, some less talented directors too. You want to say one of them, the nicest one, the ni one of the reasons I had difficulties finding a job by that time, 
my father was was considered a great maestro uh, was uh, in in France and and one of the younger directors who actually was talked into taking me on as an assistant when and one evening when we were both getting rather drunk after work and he was more or less my own generation he said you know why nobody wants to take you Marcel it's because it's because uh, uh, when we make mistakes, we're afraid that at night you go home to your father and you tell him about it. <laughs> what was it like uh, being uh, working uh, under John Houston and Moulin Rouge? Oh, I was I was the assistant. I didn't do any serious work. I was the assist, assistant in in charge of his practical jokes. <laughs> he had a very cruel sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, uh, but a very great sense of humor. He was a great personality, and it, it was his, 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 uh, the stage when he was he'd gone completely over the edge and was very Michael maniac, and 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 we were constantly taking over time, and our paychecks at the end of the week was always about four times what it was supposed to be because we we're going into silver over time and golden over time <laughs> uh, because he'd start working at three o'clock in the morning with 150 extras on the set and he would go off and sleep behind a bush in the Bois de Boulogne. And he was, uh, he was uh, yeah, he was a wonderful man, uh, but, um, uh, and, and very kind and very warm-hearted, but he had, he always had one, one, one sufferer right. in, in, in the movie, and he was the one that the practical, I remember putting the dwarf who was who was uh, doing the double for, for Toulouse Lautrec for yeah, Jose, Jose Ferrer in, in the long shots? You know, Jose Ferrer on his knees would would walk behind the behind the cart, and then on the other side the dwarf would come out <laughs> and, and, and the panning shot and, and disappear into the distance. And this fellow and and Houston, who was very very interested in people, wanted to know what this fellow did in civilian life. I uh -huh. mean, aside from being a dwarf. And, uh, uh, and and he found out that uh, that he was a gorilla man in a circus. Mm. So I had to get the gorilla suit and, 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 and put him in a cage at the circus where we went shooting. And then the gorilla escaped. And, um, and, 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 and Elliot Ellis Hoffman, who was a great life photographer, yeah. who was supposed to be the, and who was his, what do you call it, tête de turc, who was the man, who was the butt of the practical jokes, of course didn't know about it, and, and, and the gorilla uh, uh, was running behind. Um, well, it's a long anecdote. All right, so well, anyway. we get the idea. <laughs> well, um, uh, why don't we look at our first clip, uh, which is, uh, uh, the only uh, clip that is not uh, from a Marcel Olfels film, but from his father Max's last film, uh, Lola Montez, uh, on which uh, Marcel uh, Olfels actually worked. Uh, and I think it will set the stage. You mean I didn't actually work on the other ones? No, you were, <laughs> you worked on them <laughs> as well. I was just goofing off. Yeah. You worked on them no, as well. No, right. No, my father didn't want me to work with him. He used to say, uh, go and do your... Uh, you know, your apprenticeship, all the, all the foolishness, all the amateurism, do it with the others. Don't do it on my time, do it on your own time. Well, why did he want you to work uh, uh, with the, on this film particularly then? He didn't. He didn't, but... No, he was, uh, it was just, t I mean, this was the fourth or fifth opportunity of doing it, and he just got tired of saying no, I guess. Yes. Okay. Are we ready? So there we have an example of, um, of Max Ophul's um, uh, sense of spectacle, of color, of camera movement, uh, and the... Um, and pessimism. And pessimism. Uh, and, the, the, uh, and, and the woman being at the center. Uh, the, the, the typical way of viewing uh, this phenomenon of uh, two great directors, uh, your father and yourself, uh, is that there was a... Uh, that, that in a way you're opposites, that there was a break, uh, that he did a certain kind of thing and you did something that's very different. But I wonder if that's really true. I mean, we, we see the sequence with all the questions, ask your questions, and then you go on and have a whole career asking questions. Um, and in, in reviewing um, some of, uh, of Maxwell Fool's films, I see that they, they're invariably about uh, deception and self-deception. And there's also quite a bit of, of cruelty underneath the tenderness, you know, well, you know the famous tenderness. Uh, very often people do absolutely terrible things to each other. 
Um, so I wonder, uh, Michel, for here's a quarter, uh, would you answer this? Uh, um, what do you see as the continuity uh, between your father's work and your own? Um, I'll give it to you for free. Okay. <laughs> Uh, incidentally, when you, you you did tell me that you were going to pull this on me, and I thought you were, meant the last part of the film, where 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 Peter Ustinov uh, raffles off her kisses for a dollar. Uh, so I this thought is maybe just a maybe you wanted me to kiss you. So <laughs> that too, that will come later. All right. Anyway, uh, the. Um, no, I think you've already indicated what the uh, what the line is. There's several things, and it, it took most of it was unconscious, obviously, and probably still is. And uh, but when you get older, you start reflecting about resemblances to between fathers and son. It was much more intuitive at the beginning. Um, he, he had a great deal of influence on me um, in his, um, not obviously not in his style, because when you do talking heads and interviews, you can't you can't dolly around an awful lot. You know, I mean, there's no possibility for doing it. And uh, it was not that, that, that it, it was just a series of accidents that that brought me into documentaries. It's not my favorite form of filmmaking. Far from it, and certainly it wasn't my father. My father used to say, um, "Oh yeah, right, documentaries. Yes, they also exist." <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, it wasn't it wasn't really a choice on my part, nor was it an attempt to differentiate myself from his work. Uh, but I think your question is legitimate. Uh, one of the, th I think one of the great things about about this last film of his. He died two years later. As a matter of fact, he died partly because of the film, because it was such a terrible crisis film, and it was the greatest. It was the greatest flop in uh, French motion picture history, I think. And it was taken away uh, from along him. with La Règle du Jeu. La Règle du Jeu and right. these, the Rules of the Game, the game and Lo Lola Montez were the two greatest flops in, in, in French film history, uh, because for one thing and. And of course, he knew this, so there was something a little bit masochistic about the whole thing. Uh, uh, show business people know that the that the public will take a great many things and will cooperate in a great many ways, but they do not like being denounced. The public does not like being denounced. Yes, and uh, whenever you do it, and the temptation of for doing it is, is uh, for, for people who've been in show business all their life is very great. Uh, uh, um, uh, you, you have to you have to take into account that you you're probably going to be destroyed by him. And 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 Lola Montez is in that way a very prophetic film, very pessimistic film, very destructive film. And yes, it is about voyeurism. It is about la société du spectacle. It is about about uh, 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 it is prophetic about Geraldo and Phil Donahue and and uh, and asking him these people, questions people. and prying into people's lives and 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 transforming people into merchandise, mm -hmm. transforming women into merchandise, transforming uh, their lives and their mythology into into consumer goods. It's a, it's a prophetic film about the consumer society, and yes, my father did believe that movies were dying. Mm. It's one of the, it's, it's the real reason, since he did love me very much. It's the real reason why he didn't want me to get into it. He said mm. it's a, it's like a jockey on a on a thoroughbred horse who who knows that he can still make it to the to the uh, to the finish line, but who knows that the horse is going is old and is going to be tired and and, and if another jockey comes along he won't be able to make it all the way. He sometimes spoke in metaphors. Anyway <laughs> uh, and, and and I think this is true. I think I think the two great popular art forms of the twentieth century, we were talking about this earlier, were well, are um, motion pictures and jazz. And and they were the, both of them very American, both of them killed by what came afterwards. 
uh, well, let me television just... and rock. And, and for very similar reasons, because, because of vulgarity, because of wireism, because of narcissism, because of the culture of narcissism. Now, this business about asking questions. Yes, um, uh, uh, the, uh, I ask questions because, because, I, because I didn't want to use voice of God commentary, and once I was forced into the ghetto of making documentary films, there aren't really 55 ways of doing them. You either, uh, you either uh, use direct cinema techniques the way my friend Wiseman does, yeah. one of the few documentaries with no, yeah. with no but, but, or you do TV documentary, the traditional TV documentary with what John Grierson called Voice of God commentary, which, which I despise because it's, uh, because it's a way of, of, of wasting uh, movie making. It's, it's, it's a way of selling it cheap. And uh, yes, I, I try to tell stories uh, by, um, by uh, using real characters and, and, and the way to, to, uh, to get them to live on the screen is to establish a dialogue with them. And um, hmm. I think that's why I ask questions. Well, uh, did what, what kind of work did you do on uh, Lola Montez? Just curious. Uh, oh, I think it never became quite clear whether I was the second, the third, or the fourth assistant. Uh, but, uh, I certainly wasn't the first. Wasn't the there first something, more. in a way, prophetic also in that the film had so many problems with its producers, the producer recut it, and, and, and uh, considering some of the problems you've had with producers, uh, there was like... Final cut, sure. Yeah, it was like yeah. a preparation so, One man, one film, sure. Frank yeah. Capra, uh, the name above the title, uh, moral rights, trois d'auteur, uh, you name it. Sure, uh, I, it, again, this is, has to do with being the heir to my father, that, that I'm a militant for author's rights and for, for, for the idea that, uh, that, um, that film, which in many ways is a collective enterprise, but, but financiers and the consumer society like to use this concept of of teamwork mm -hmm. and, and uh, as as an alibi for uh, for uh, for merchandising and for anonymity and for uh, for taking it, it's it's very easy to become arrogant and 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 pompous on these issues and one should try to avoid it but I think the idea that 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 it is an artistic form, and therefore it should correspond to the subjectivity of individuals. Yeah. Uh, sometimes the individual is the director. Uh, sometimes there is some other stronger personality. But no, I don't believe that Selznick is a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. I think Hitchcock is. Hitchcock was the yes. filmmaker. Um, you, I I remember seeing um, a short film that you made um, in. Uh, in Love at Twenty, the comp compilation film, uh, and uh, this was uh, during the period of the New Wave, and Truffaut had one of the um, short, one of the episodes, and you had another, and Andre Vida, the Polish director, mm -hmm. and uh, Renzo Rossellini, who was uh, Rossellini's uh, son or brother, uh, son, son. So there was a little bit of like uh, uh, kind of um, nepotism, nepotism opportunity for. And I think it well, that was Truffaut's. Uh, Truffaut, Truffaut was was obsessed about fathers and sons because he didn't have a father, as as you know, if you've seen the Four Hundred Blows. He had a he had a step like Maupassant, and then he had a stepfather, and he didn't know his father, like Chaplin, and, and it's something that seems to occur in our business quite a lot. And therefore, he had a he had a strange kind of since he was self-educated, and since he came out of the Paris slums like Chaplin came out of the London slums, he had this great uh, reverence and respect for uh, for people who actually were sons who had yes. great fathers yes. and, and, and this ah. was what our friendship was based on. So, ah, so you, you, you uh, both had this friendship with Truffaut and you also, in a way, when I saw that film, it seemed as though you were positioned to become uh, a new wave director. 
Um, the film, what I mostly remember is a long car scene or something like that. Am I right? But I haven't I seen don't it. Know. I, I haven't seen it for, for 30 years. years. Uh, I'd love to see it again. We were unable to track down a print in the United States. It doesn't seem to be one. But anyway, um, you, made that sh you made that short. And um, you made a short on Matisse also. Uh, yes. It was a documentary. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Matisse thing, I think, came first. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was a producer who who had uh, again uh, he had been uh, it was a Romanian Jewish French producer uh, a real very fat man and very great, great producer and caricature of a producer he always smoked a cigar you know? and uh, and he wanted to do a whole this was when 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 television was starting out and and he wanted to do a pilot film on painters. Hmm. And uh, uh, for American television, 20-minute films, and he was always talking about the man in Texas. He said this has to be made for the man in Texas, and so we can't show any paintings because the only thing that the man in Texas is interested <laughs> in is is uh, uh, is artists who suffer. Uh -huh. And I said, well, uh, Mr. Deutschmeister, if we can't sh if we can't film the paintings, uh, uh, what about actors? Uh, then we have to get actors. He said, no, we can't afford actors. <laughs> so I said, well, what, what, what are we going to put on the screen if we can't put the paintings on and we can't put actors on? He said, that's what I'm paying you for. That's what you should come up <laughs> with. So, and then he wanted artists to suffer. So I went across the street and went to see Francois Truffaut and said, Francois, who do you think, aside from Renoir, who's already been done, who, is, who was the happiest of all the French painters, in your opinion? Yes. And he said, Matisse. So I said, well, then that's Let's what I'm do doing. Let's that do what the reverse, <laughs> reverse of you. <laughs> no, artist who doesn't suffer. So you, you can see I was already against, yes. uh, I was already a, a troublemaker, yes. a troublemaker from the very beginning. But did you film Matisse while he was, no, he wasn't. No, he was dead. dead yes, sir. No. And what happened on this, if I may just add something, because again, it has to do with author's rights. Uh, you know that there's a big exhibition now uh, yes. in, in New York, which yes, is which the I've biggest seen. one, where they've got the Hermitage stuff together. Yes and the, the Barnes collection, and it's, it's, it's as big as a Picasso thing. And about four or five years ago, when the Matisse family was, was, was preparing the exhibition, they wrote me a very nice letter, and Pierre and Jean Matisse they were very nice people. They used to, when we, when we were late uh, during the filming, they would wrap some of the paintings up in brown paper bags and say, well, why don't you just take it home and bring it back to get through with it? <laughs> <laughs> it scared the hell out of me. You know, I had this small car, and I would hang in the brown paper bag and take the Matisse home and put it up next to the television set. <laughs> and <laughs> it was quite an experience. Anyway, so uh, they wrote a letter saying that having seen about 10 or 12 Matisse films, they had decided that, including ones where Matisse was still alive, yes. they had decided that mine was the most fun and, and, and the best one, and they wanted to have it for, to run in a loop with it outside the museum with the exhibition. So I wrote the fucking distributor, excuse me, the distributors who... who <laughs> I think I've oh, heard of that distributor, yes. Yes, have you, yes. And <laughs> And, and, and said, well, uh, the Matisse family, to send them a photostat of the letter. And, um, and they, since they were also the, the, the people who had bought some of my father's films and I'd given them, my lawyer and I had given them some trouble on this, they were very hostile and they pretended that the film no longer existed and that they hadn't bought it from the original producer. And then there was a retrospective of my films at the Institut du Mien in Lyon some months ago and the man who was doing it said, well, let's have Matisse. And I said, well, it is, doesn't exist anymore. The negative's gone, the and Matisse they family. It. And they went to Guadassi, where they had the archives. They found six prints. Mm -hmm. So it was just, you know, it wasn't negligence. It was yeah. just hostility. And the interesting thing about it, and this is what's important about it, why, why we do have to be resistance fighters, is that they would have made a lot of money. Yeah because the, the, the exhibition's going around the world for the next 10 years. They would have, you know, they would have cleaned up on it. Yeah. yeah just vengeance. Okay, I'm, back, I'm, I'm trying to move this uh, yeah. ever so gently, this narrative forward uh, of your life. Uh, and um, after, <laughs> yes, after making Love at 20, uh, you made a few um, uh, 
fiction feature films which I've not seen. Uh, one is Banana Peel and the other one is uh, uh, Fra Volante, Volante, or however you pronounce it. Anyway, Fire at Will. Fire at Will. And uh, Banana Peel was with um, uh, was with Belmondo and uh, Jean Moreau, mm -hmm. and uh, so you were you were starting out um, uh, in some pretty heavy company and um, starting out as uh, you know making a. Uh, what I understand was it was a popular comedy. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah. I wish I could have stayed with that. It was a very successful film. It wasn't. It, it wasn't fashionable at the time because the Cahiers du Cinéma at that time were going in another direction. And so again, I wanted to do an American star, Cary Grant, Irene Dunn sort of thing, and uh, and it was it was a good movie, very successful, good box office. But uh, after that, I made a very, very bad film. So, of course, everybody said, well, the first thing was just a fluke because it had great stars in it and, and he was covering his ass and playing it safe. So then I had to go for the groceries and I went into television. I'm moving ahead, you see. Yes, please. And I went in, <laughs> please. Into, into television and, uh, and started doing 15-minute uh, reportage things, having a lot of fun very, for very little pay in the French Monopoly at the time. And that's how I started on, and then when, when, when the producers of French television suddenly had a whole evening thrust at them for, to do contemporary history, since I was the only one with, uh, with uh, uh, a feature experience, since mm -hmm. I was their senior director at the time, because I had come from the Champs-Élysées, they just threw it my way. And the way it happened was that um, one of the two producers, we were in the office, it was a very small office, and there were 15 of us every day, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and one of them said to me, uh, Marcel, uh, we've got the three hours uh, to do contemporary history archival uh, uh, footage. How would you like to do Munich? And I said, well, uh, the city or the conference? And he said, well, naturally, the conference. <laughs> so 1938. You know, the appeasement. Shame, the, the, appeasement, appeasement conference. the appeasement thing. And uh, the sound of pity was actually just a follow-up of that. And, uh, and then I got stuck in documentaries because both of these films were extremely successful. Yeah, let me just say something about that. You know, I've read so often in statements about you that this, uh, this um, uh, biting the hand that feeds you attitude toward documentaries. I mean, there's something to me a little disingenuous about it. It's like, you know, the burglar who makes his living as a burglar all the time. He says, I got stuck as a burglar. Well, you know, if all you do is rob people's houses, then you are indeed a burglar. So if, if what you do is make documentaries all your life, you are a documentarian. documentarian. No, I don't deny that. And, but, and, uh, but, but you haven't seen Banana Peel. I haven't, no. no. But, uh, but I think there's something, I think, I think that, uh, I mean, let's face it, it's, you are arguably not just a documentarian, but the greatest documentarian. Uh, the one that's well, I don't know if I am, but if I, 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 I would, I would, I no, would that's not, me, not out of force. But, but, yes, but, but you don't have to, to agree, but, but I mean... No, well, I almost one agree. Of, you almost agree. Uh, I, <laughs> I think Fred Wiseman is, is at least as good as he is, I am. He is at least very as great, good. yes. And, and, and Lanzmann has, has, has probably done the greatest, greatest historical documentary of all times. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, we're talking about whole careers. In all right, life. yeah. Well, on the whole career thing, I'm not inclined to disagree with you. One but one, uh, but one, one of the reasons, one of the reasons, I, I offer this in all honesty and, and without any access of false modesty, uh, I think that uh, that it, that if I am good, it's also because I'm entertaining. Yeah. It's because I can hold the distance on three or four hour. Films where other people, where other documentarians would, 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 would let the audience get bored or do its duty. So it's partly and, because you and came it's in. Partly because I don't like them. It's, it's because the is that I put so much effort into making them entertaining. <laughs> well, there is something to be said for the idea that you you came in from 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 fiction films into documentaries. But I I'm reminded of Michael Moore saying the same thing about uh, Roger and me. He he kept. Going around saying well, how much he hated documentaries. Fan. Yeah, well, he's a fan of mine. Yeah. He, he's, 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 uh, he said he hated documentaries. Well, I mean, to some he degree. He got that from me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To some degree, because it's like uh, supposedly box office poison or something like that. Well, well that's. 
the sure, great documentary. But there's a reason say, for it. I don't like documentaries. But you know? no, no, listen, there's a reason for its being box office poison. Most of them are terribly dull. It's one of the reasons that I did not, not only uh, 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 tend to despise documentaries, but more than that, documentarians, is because they make my life so difficult. Because, uh, because, uh, because obviously, people who people like you tonight who are kind enough to come here, uh, uh, you, you, you are of course aware that you are a tiny minority of the audience. And there is something respectable about, about making documentaries as opposed to, to real show business. There's something dreadfully respectable. And uh, it's, uh, you know, people will say, oh, I, the only thing I watch on on television is, is <laughs> documentaries <laughs> and PBS. And, and, and it's not true. They're lying. Uh, uh, because if they weren't lying, I'd be a rich man. And I'm not. So, uh, you know, this is the voice of experience. So, no, I'm not apologetic about it. Uh, it's, it's just that... Uh, Yes, I do feel like a prisoner, and yes, incidentally, on German television, once in a while, these things don't get around, but I see that you have it on, on your list here. Of the four. I, I, I did Sasha Guitry, who was a, who was a, friend, who was a great phrase, the French Noel coward. Yes. And, and I did a German adaptation on television on Sasha Guitry, and, and, and yeah, I think it was good, and I certainly enjoyed myself more than going around interviewing old Nazis. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Who wouldn't rather make a film with Catherine Deneuve than going around and asking questions of old Nazis? I mean. But yet you so do. So it's not disingenuous. It's it's sincere. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that. Um, well, you, from um, my understanding, is that um, uh, you were working at uh, French TV, and then uh, you. Uh, had a falling out with them uh, before or during the time you were making Sorrow and the Pity, uh, having to do with the, ni the events of 1968 and the, um, the oh, there strike. There were 15,000 of us that had a falling out yes. with French TV. With French TV. I wasn't what? the only one. Well, what there happened? were 15,000 of us, but I was, one of the f I was one of the strike leaders. Uh -huh. That's why I was afterwards, right. because we lost that strike. It was the only strike on French... It was the only strike in 1968, which was, of course part of the student uprising and Danny Cohn bended and you know, some of you may remember this although most of you weren't born but uh, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the night of the barricades and all of that very romantic glamorous stuff and people would open their window and look out and they would see the cops beating up on the, on the students, some of them were their kids you know on the left bank of Paris you could open the window at night on the balcony and you could see it happening but we weren't allowed to show it on TV mm. because it was the Gaullist French monopoly. It was like Franco Spain, you know. So we went on strike. It was a very noble strike. It wasn't to get a higher salary. It was for freedom of information. We wanted to we wanted to have the same privilege as the BBC. Yeah. And uh, and obviously we didn't get it. So uh, the strike leaders were. I didn't even wait to be fired. I would, during the strike, which lasted for six weeks, I sent my German wife to Switzerland with the family because this was the old Jewish refugee syndrome. I thought if the fascists or the commies came in, it would be better to have the family elsewhere. And then she phoned uh, uh, in Hamburg uh, to friends of mine in Hamburg. And so by the time the strike was over, I already had another job in, in in Germany, where I then made the Sorrow and the Pity, which was originally supposed to be made for French television. For French television, um, the Sorrow and the Pity uh, was a was a revelation when it when it uh, first came out. Uh, it wasn't shown on French TV, uh, uh, but it was shown in a uh, theater in Paris, and uh, uh, it quickly caught on when it came to America. It was a, it was um, I think a. Uh, such a landmark documentary that we could talk about documentary up to the Saw and the Pity and documentaries after the Saw and the Pity. Um, and of course it was about um, uh, a chronicle of a French town during the occupation and about uh, in the larger question of France's uh, collaboration with the Nazis and those who were heroic, those who were 
cowardly and those who are just ordinary. Um, it seems to me a very happy idea that you hit upon uh, uh, focusing it on a French town instead of trying to do all of France. How did you, how did you come up with that idea of uh, focusing on Clermont-Ferrand? Uh, well, I think you've answered your own question. Uh, it's uh, one of the most, but since I, since I well, this, this I think is an important and, and uh, exceptionally perhaps not a frivolous, <laughs> can't be frivolous all evening. This is a serious point about yeah. documentaries. I don't think they should ever be scripted because if you script the documentary, you're a whore. Uh, most most TV executives nowadays uh, demand uh, that script. documentaries be scripted, and and this is basically a, a, a treason to the form, because obviously, uh, 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 well, I admire Hitchcock and I admire the great filmmakers who 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 put everything on paper and are very precise. But if I know in advance what what the old Nazi or the old na anti-Nazi or the young one are going to tell me or what the people, what the statesmen or the ordinary people are going to tell me or even if I know in advance exactly what kind of sampling of the population I'm going to have. If I, uh, this is already very, very dull. It's it dead. means it's dead. It's dead before it's born. Because you can't be you surprised. Have, that's right. You can't be surprised. You have to, the filmmaker has to be surprised first and then hand on the surprise to the audience. I think this is the whole, the whole point of documentary filming. It's also the only thing that's fun about. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's the only thing that makes it come alive. So um, uh, when, when, when you say, uh, why, did you, why did you pick a town? Well, because reality is infinite, yeah. uh, but, but a screen is like this. You have to put it in a framework. Yes. So like all, all forms of art, novels, painting, and anything, it's always this business of content and form, which means you have to put it in a frame. And so the only thing that I am always extremely stubborn about at the beginning, and, and, and the great, very often uh, uh, the people I work with, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, um, uh, the producers, and, but also the cameramen, uh, don't understand that when I, when I'm insist, when I say, well, um, to do uh, to do a Hollywood power plays, which I once did forty hours for ABC News, to do the Hollywood power play uh, called Company Town about about uh, who has the power in Hollywood. Um, I need the Oscar footage. If I don't have the Oscar, I can't, can't cut from the interviews uh, uh, when they run out of steam. Uh, go from one interview to the other, from one producer to the other, from from Deal Beach and back. If I don't have this self celebration as a punctuation, or if you talk about November days, uh, the whole idea in November days that you can do if, if 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 the BBC asks me to do something about Germany in the year when the Berlin Wall falls, it's it's a you know a Tolstoy couldn't do it. Yeah, so you it's, need it's, it's, it's silly. So you need Silly. to focus. So yeah, you need to focus, and and this is what I call my coat hanger idea. And you had all of these ideas and that that you um, the coat hanger idea. The coat hanger. This yeah. is the, the town. And and in the in the case of it's it's very banal, but it's the in my opinion it was the only way of handling four years of war, and it's thirty five individuals who happened to live in the town. And then of course we cheated because a lot of people yes. who appear in the film never were in Clermont-Ferrand in their life. Yeah. But mostly it's based on Clermont-Ferrand. And there were a few things that you did. You in could this have put a pin on a map, and then it you could have been any, any other place. Yes, but you it did have to be a place. Let me just finish very quickly on November days. I, I guess you want to show a short clip from. I want to show a clip, and I don't want to get too much into okay, November, into November days. days. Okay, end. well then. Okay. But I wanted to just say that. Um, you developed a lot of uh, what became uh, your trademarks. It was a mixture of interviews and newsreels. In fact, the, some of the uh, Nazi newsreels in Salon the Pity are just incredible uh, stuff. Uh, and there's also this emphasis on daily life. It's not just total histor you know, big history with a capital H. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, how they had a nylon shortage, so they painted nylons uh, with, a paint, with a ink or something like that. And there's this whole range of humanity from, from heroism to cowardice. And there's this uh, kind of... But it's not about, if I may say one thing, yeah. because it's, very, uh, it's been very often a misunderstanding. It's not a film, 
and even less is it a judgment uh -huh. about the behavior of the French. Right. Were the French this? Were the French that? It's the story of 35 individuals who remember a particular time in their life which was a time of humiliation and crisis and what they did or didn't do. But it's, and, 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 it's a, and, and it's a juxtaposition of their fate together with the collective fate of a nation. And I think this is the only way to make that sort of thing because who the hell can presume to judge how a nation behaves. Yeah, this, this is what uh, Anthony Eden says at one point, uh, the, the, uh, the ex-Prime Minister of England. He says, um, you know, a country which has not uh, been invaded, which has not been occupied, uh, has, no, has no right to judge a country which has. And that it's, goes for generations. Yeah. It doesn't and, just go to countries. I mean, young people who, when, when the Song and the Pity came out in, in, in the States, and that was one of the things when I was happy about at the time and still am happy about it was the reason it was successful in the states is not because because people thought ha ha the french and ha and then the french did this or the french did yeah. that they took it as a metaphor for their own problems about vietnam mm -hmm. it was taken as you remember it was taken as a film about about how what position should we, the young people, take about our own problems, about about this war that that Clinton and the others felt were unjust. Right. No. Yes. Uh, um, the, I think of the movie uh, uh, above all as an as an amazing collection of of uh, portraits of of uh, human beings uh, who, who I, I who I really came to know when I was watching the film and. Uh, there are wonderful portraits of Pierre Mendes France and Anthony Eden and uh, the resistance fighter Gaspar and uh, this English spy Dennis Rake. But the clip that we're going to show is uh, one of the most um, fascinating of all the portraits, which is uh, a portrait of a of a, a man who, uh, named Christian de la Mazière who was in fact a, a right winger, a fascist uh, during this period. And now... Uh, you're coming back to interview him, and he's reflecting on why he chose that path. In fact, he, he enlisted in the Charlemagne Brigade, which was a group of right-wing French who went and fought in, on the Eastern Front, even as uh, the war was coming to an end, and as the, he fought with the Nazis. May I just add one yes. footnote to this? I didn't interview him. No. My partner, and my eyes, who is on screen, yes. uh, going through this chateau with him. Uh, interviewed him, and the reason I didn't interview him, one of the reasons is that he refused to be interviewed by, by a, a Jew. He was he was scared. Or he didn't he didn't want to. It was very hard at that time. It was still very hard. Nowadays it'd be very easy, but at that time it was very hard to get hold of a man who was willing to admit that he fought on the German side and that he was a fascist. And and when we got hold of this man who was in real life a a, um, a uh, press attaché in the film business. He was a, um, what do you call it, public relations mm. man and a playboy. And um, very, very nice and intelligent fellow, but he did, he did make it a condition that I would not interview him. So I don't always ask the questions. All right, let's run it right. down. When I went through the clips uh, of your films, I, I realized this is about a 10 minute clip uh, we had to do 10-minute clips. I realized that you don't really work in 10-minute blocks. You work much more in 20 and 25-minute blocks. This sequence, I should explain, goes on, uh, con continues with this very same person and works around to this very moving moment where he, he, um, he talks all about what it was like being uh, a soldier in this German army, and he says that... Uh, He's basically very skeptical of ideology now. Um, one of the, it, it, it kind of, it fascinates me for a few reasons. Um, formally, it's rather different from a lot of your work in that. Uh, it, they walk. 
They walk. There's a, there's the equivalent of a, of a tracking shot, an Ophulsian tra- tracking shot. It's very, it has a real mise en scene. There's a sense of, uh, of the surroundings that's very important to character, which I think you, you do often, but more, um, you know, uh, uh, less uh, ostentatiously, you know. Here. Well, I try to avoid mise en scene because, because in documentaries, again, you, if you, if you, if you ask the characters to do things, uh, then you're not uh, you're not letting them come to you. You're putting them in some sort of straitjacket. I think this should the, the the reason it's done here. This is this is the castle that Celine, the yes. famous Celine castle, and it's castle the castle. Yes. yes, it's it's Sigmaringen, and and the reason uh, the reason this was done that way is because by the time uh, Christian finally made his mind up, in spite of his lawyers, to actually say yes, we were. Out of money, and all road shoot it in the last days of filming in Germany. They couldn't afford to take the film crew back to Paris, ah. and so he had to come to us. Ah. And so we had to figure out some way of yes. of uh, no. But this ah. is what documentaries are made of. And we had to figure out some way of tying in Germany with him. And so Sigma Ringen seemed to be the natural thing. And once we had Sigma Ringen, since it was a castle, I thought, well, we'll have a guide to juxtapose, a German guide, and then we'll let those two. And since there were two Parisians, since Henri Harris was doing the interview, and they were both in a foreign country, I thought they should walk. But yes, this is exceptional. I think mostly uh, talking heads should be sitting where they want to sit in their own Archie Bunker chair or whatever <laughs> they... The other, <laughs> the other thing that, um, that, I, that I think about this sequence is that again and again you're, you're going to people uh, and asking them about, about events that happened 30, 40 years ago and you're, you're probing to see how much have they digested the meaning of these experiences. How much are they lying to themselves? How much are they rationalizing? How much have they grown to, to uh, integrate what happened to them? And, and, and this particular person seems, uh, with a certain amount of dignity, to actually to have come out on the good side, let's say, to have actually... By the good side, I don't just mean politically. I mean, he, he's digested it, and he's taken responsibility he's for his actions. He's you, Philip. He conned me? Yes, he certainly did. And he's conned a great many people. Ah. Uh, he, he's <laughs> he's, uh, he's a great... Uh, uh, yeah, this business you, you referred to where at the end he says... Uh, it, but it plays well. It's good show business. At the end of the interview he says, well, I, I've, I've lost my illusions. And, and, that then, and, that, uh, and then the very next scene is the liberation of Paris and you get all these people shouting, hooray, etc. So it's, it's a, uh, this, this sort of melancholy. But, but I must tell you that he has... Uh, at the time he was... Sincere, he thought he had become a liberal, and uh, and Andre Aris was interviewing him, and who at that time was a, a left wing socialist, uh, thought that being a liberal meant uh, the, meant you know humanist, etc. I must say that right now I've heard that he thinks that Le Pen is too moderate. <laughs> okay, all right, this is really interesting. But in, in, you've you've conned you've us come also back because to his real roots. in the context of the movie, at this moment, it seems as though he is he has um, he's digested and assimilated the experience and taken responsibility for it. Well, I, he's intelligent. I think the th- the thing that seduced a lot of people in the, uh, including you, I guess, about. I was never quite taken in by him. He was quite right in not wanting me to interview him ah. because, because I wouldn't have let him off that easy. Ah. But uh, because I happened to know that he also uh, arrested people and he was also in the militia and so forth. But he was not as glamorous as he makes himself out to be. Uh, but uh, the... the uh, what was I going to say about that? Um, Okay. I think the reason why he's so appealing is that at that time, people didn't expect Nazis and fascists to be quite human, and and at that time it was an important in the life in the political life of France and in the way of dealing with history in France. At that time, it was very very important to show that an SS man can be intelligent. Mm-hmm. So was Bobby. You know, Bobby was a good very family young. father, oh, yeah. and he was a very bright fellow. Uh, it's 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 very restrictive. It's a very restrictive view of history. 
to think that our opponents and, and our adversaries our and the people who made the 20th century into the living hell that it was and that it still is, that all of these people are pinheads. They're not. No, no. But also it fit into the, he fit in in a way to the, to what seems like a class analysis in the film, yeah, which is yeah. that, that the, many people, it seems like the film seems to be taking the position that, uh, that the working class, um, acquitted themselves much better than the bourgeoisie uh, and the aristocracy, and here he seems to be like a, 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 high, a high bourgeois character. Um, I think this is true. Uh, uh, I think this is true generally. It's a generalization, but I think it's true that by and large the French bourgeoisie did not behave well during the occupation and that most of the resistance came from the Communist Party and came from the came from the working class. And, and I think this is made clear in the film. But I must also add very, very quickly and, and because we I guess we do have to move on no, no, is, okay. is that we is can that I was left four and a half I was hours more left of center then <laughs> uh -huh. than I am now. Yeah, it does seem like the like the film was trying uh -huh. more to more, uh, you were more eager to. Um, well, it to was. Push. It's an anti-Gaullist film too. It was a film that, at that time, the people who made this film and I wanted to overcome the 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 the, 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 the restrictive uh, 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 Gaullist myth about about all of France having been heroic, mm -hmm. which was in fact a very reactionary way of keeping. French society in its place. So, in that way, uh, in that way, it is a film of the '68 period. It is we were indeed very much influenced right. by by the political ideas of the '68 period. We wanted to bring De Gaulle and Gaullism down. Sure, we did. No, we and you have and social you have democrats. One of the ca one of the figures you interview says, "Well, the 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 rich had more to lose, and so uh, yeah, they well, collaborated sure. with, more with the Nazis." Yeah. Um, I still want to. I still want to. Uh, pin you down a little bit on this whole question of, of um, development of, uh, of self. Uh, your movies have been compared to, to uh, psychoanalysis, uh, to a kind of psychoanalytical process, and psychoanalysis is all about taking responsibility and, uh, and digesting and finally understanding and not just blaming other people for one's experiences. Do you, do you accept this comparison? Yes, I think so. When, well, Especially again, we were talking about my father, who was so very much against my going into into show business because of his 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 theory about jockeys. He did think that I should go into that I should make good psychoanalyst, probably really? because I gave him a hard time on some of his. <laughs> also, you know, psychoanalysis is very involved with the notion of resistance, and resistance is such yes. a loaded word in your, not just French resistance, but the terms of, you know, in analysis yes. where you talk about the resistance to the therapy and working with resistance yes. as an act of force. Yes. And there's another uh, psychoanalytical notion which I find uh, has, 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 that I've become very much aware of in my work. It's the Freudian notion of, uh, um, of, uh, uh, um, Oh, what's it called in English? Trauerarbeit, uh, uh, le travail de deuil, um, uh, um, mourning. Mourning work. Mourning work, working, yeah. working out your Working mourning. through grief. Did you? Well, uh, yes, working. Uh, Were you ever in psychoanalysis? Uh, no, no. no. Uh, partly I can ask him of anything up here. Yeah. No, no, partly because of that. No, I, I, I certainly needed it. I probably still do. Uh, uh, it seems too late now, you know. It takes, as Woody Allen tells us, it takes uh, 15 years, and I haven't got 15 years. Also, it's very expensive. Uh, but uh, uh, no, there's another reason. Um, because of what you just pointed out, um, psychoanalysts, like doctors generally, have a great business about celebrity cult, and um, and they're very they're very um, movie crazy usually. Yes. And uh, I've been the guest in Chicago, for instance, of the Bettelheim Group and so yes. on. And, um, and 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 if they if they give up their authority and their prestige because they think that I'm the psychoanalyst, yes. then I can't really run to them when I'm in trouble. Yeah. Uh, that's a rationalization if I ever heard one. Okay, we'll move uh, on. Uh, <laughs> um, yes. This, uh, <laughs> um, 
This movie is shot in black and white, and um, there's a kind of uh, ha harmonic match between the newsreel footage and the um, and the uh, the archival footage and uh, and the interviews. Um, uh, but it was the last of your films, I think, that was made in black and white. Um, uh, does that? Um, do you miss being able to do that because of the old newsreels, the way it moves from one from black and white palette to black and white palette? Uh, Truffaut said something uh, uh, very, I think, rather significant about that. He said, he said when uh, uh, when 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 Saw and Pity was revived, I think in eight seventy nine, and then in eighty one, uh, he said, well, it's all become history now. Hmm. And Mondes, the interviews are now also history, and yes. it tells us about the 60s and about Mondes France and about Gaulism and so forth. And the fact that the fact that it's all rather grainy and black and white now makes it more integrated. Yes, um, huh. and 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 it is indeed uh, uh, the 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 difference between uh, interviews in color and archival footage in black and white is a sort of an easy, cheap way of, 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 of showing the distance yes. historically. It's, 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 uh, I agree with you, I think it's probably more... Pro but then on the other hand, uh, you, uh, you can't really afford to be an aesthete on documentary films because you've got to sell them to television and they're not easy to sell, as, as everyone knows. So uh, you're, not going to, uh, you're not going to go into a lot of aesthetic considerations. You can't just be black and white. What no, about the you can't. What about the uh the 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 uh the voiceover um sometimes subtitles sometimes voiceover was that your choice or was yes. it the distributors? No, well, no. It was not only my choice. I I, I made it. I mean, I I, I you made directed that, I directed the voice. The um, the soundtrack, the American. Yes, version. because I put my own questions in English, and and uh, the, the the principle is very simple. When it's uh, when it's documents, or when it's uh, the guide, for instance that we saw just now he's subtitled because he's because he's not a, he's not in a major interview he's not mm -hmm. uh, you can't do uh, you uh, I, I believe that it's very hard to do a four and a half hour film that is supposed to be seen by as many people as possible and ask them to read subtitles especially on interviews because yes. uh, it's not like dialogue in a western where you where, where Gary Cooper only speaks every five minutes, you know, uh, on Talking Heads, you really if if, it's if you subtitle them, they they'll go up into <laughs> they grow up into your eyes. Yes. So um, that's the reason why you have voiceover, and of course you can't have lip sync yeah. because if you'd have lip sync, then the authenticity no, goes down. So there's a whole technique that has to be developed where where you, where where the where the, uh, you hear uh, the where, where they hear the confirmation of you, somebody says revolution the, violence the, the, violence rev, yeah. revolu uh, revolution and then yeah violence violence yes, and so forth. Yeah. exactly All right. now um, one la one more question about so on a pity it was it was hailed as a as a masterpiece um, was this a problem having you know made a masterpiece so early in your efforts to make documentaries in the sense that did did it become for you an albatross I'm of a expectations? Very slow starter, probably a slow learner too, but certainly a late starter. Uh -huh. uh, banana peel, uh, the, 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 on the Champs Elysees, the the big panel for banana peel. Excuse me for doing a flashback. Uh, went up on my 31st, 35th birthday. Yes, and and I had taken an oath long before that if I couldn't have a first feature film by the time I was 35, then I would quit. Yeah. And it went up on November 1st ah. at, at midnight on a Wednesday. And you were 43 yeah. when uh, yeah, Sal and the Pity came yeah, out. Yeah, I was a great deal older, yeah. so I was certainly wasn't, was, was no neophyte. Oh, I don't mean that. I just mean uh, um, in terms of um, people are expecting you to do the Sal and Pity over and over again. Yeah, well, that's what I was complaining about early in the evening, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you thought I was being disingenuous. No, no, you won't let me get all away from that. I just meant... <laughs> No, nah, the complaint I took from the heart. I just meant that when you said you were a kind of a, a documentarian in spite of yourself, I think that, that um, there also was a certain volition involved and, uh, and a certain uh, métier, you know. Um, 
Yeah, well, you, 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 it's, it's certainly, I mean, filmmaking in general, you learn by trial and error. I mean, you, you don't pick up all that much in film schools, even if you go to film schools, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, you, you learn by trial and error, whether it's documentaries or anything else. So then you made um, a Sense of Loss, uh, which is um, a film about the Irish Troubles, and um, this is a very different infeeling from uh, Saul and the Pity, very, very interesting and moving film. In fact, it's called... So guess what the coat hanger is in Sense of Loss, since you've just seen the film. I'm starting, you see, turning the tables around, I'm interviewing you. What the Incidentally, one of the most interesting thing about interrogation and asking questions, yes. this is the only thing I really enjoyed in the Barbie film, was the possibility of turning the tables on professional interrogators. interrogators. In fact, uh, spooks, you know, absolutely. counter spies. Absolutely. And real, real nasty. In November guys days, too. Uh, you, you interview uh, Marcus Wolf, the head of the Stasi, yes. you know. Yes, and here you are with the camera, and all of a sudden, here these guys have to sit still. People who probably tortured people. But have a heart, Marcel. I never, I never was no, no, a you know, you never spy or no, no, worked no, for Stasi. So I'm not turning thing. the table on <laughs> No, but I do. Well, what do sure. you think the coat hanger idea and sense of loss is? The funerals. The funerals, yes, because you keep returning again sure. and again to the sure. people. The, the constant is, it's death. is people who, who have lost someone. Uh, you know, there was uh, Hence all the, the victims. Title. Hence all the, the victims. title, yes. yes. And since I couldn't, you see, I was expected to take sides because I was sent over there. These are usually assignments. Uh, it was a New York Jewish outfit, a man called Donald Rogoff, who had, all, who had Irish patriots working in his office, young women who were Irish and who, whose idea was, well, we'll send Ophuls to Ireland to do what he did for the French resistance yes. with the Irish patriots. Well, I couldn't identify with, uh, yes. with the IRA, no matter how hard I tried. Uh, I really didn't think that there was any <laughs> that there was any similarity between French resistance fighters and bomb throwers. So uh, <laughs> I, I still can't. So I mean, I like the Irish. I think they're great, but uh, they're wonderful people. But uh, so it it was a film about about the but which which is really the which is really unsatisfying because you should. Uh, I think a really good film of that kind should be very subjective. It should, it should, it should, it should not be propaganda, but it should be able to um, to take a side. Mm -hmm. And if if the only thing you can identify, uh, the only thing you can sympathize with, are the oppressed, yeah, uh, then this is the traditional. Uh, Documentary, nya, nya, nya. bleeding heart documentary. Bleeding heart documentary. But you, you do, you and, do, and and to overcome that, and I think sense of loss does overcome it to uh -huh. some extent. Is I had to find a coat hanger, and and again, it's this, it's the funerals. You do seem to sympathize uh, more with the Catholics and the Protestants, but that again seems to be more for class reasons than anything else, because you and because they were taking the shit. Uh, but. Yeah, but uh, in in fact, when I was in Belfast, I thought that in the evening when we weren't filming, the Protestants were a lot more fun. They drank more. <laughs> they were uh, they were funnier. They uh, they were not uh, the, 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 the 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 Catholics in Belfast were sort of clammy. Sometimes some sort of you know this Catholic thing with Very all, this, all these big families and they didn't wash every day and uh, that's what the Protestants said. So. Yes, I know, I know. I'm, uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. Uh, the 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 other difference there, there are a lot of uh, this is much more a film made in the moment rather than reflecting back uh, historically. One of the things that that is so. Uh, eerie about Saw and the Pity when you see it now, and, and I think even when it first came out was that it's about these tragic events, but it has a certain serenity, a certain calm. Um, uh, Saw and the Pity is actually rather, it's a Western, and it is indeed, we were talking about optimism and yeah. pessimism, it is in a way a rather naive and optimistic film. At that time, I still th thought that any person who was in the resistance was a great hero and people who were collaborationists were obviously in some way villains. So you started working subtleties 
uh, with Christian Lemazier, you saw, but the basic thing was like a John Wayne movie. It wasn't subtle at all. There were the, the, the bad guys and the good guys, the white hats and the black hats. And I've lost some of that naivete because, uh, because uh, doing Bobby, I think I found out that not all resistance people were heroes. I'm not sure that I that I I think that what you say is obviously true, but I'm not sure I agree completely. I don't think that it's just a question of you being able to identify you being able to identify who the heroes and villains were and so on. But it's also that there is this kind of the the tone, the pace is rather calm. It unfurls in a, in a certain no. unmeasured way. For instance, the Christian de la Maison episode is uh, is intact practically 20 minutes like a short story um, in later films you would never do 20 minutes on one person you'd always have it much more interwoven you know uh, and, and it was more and you developed more of a kind of um, uh, rough texture you know um, more abrasive texture I think so it's almost like like the way I interpret it is, is uh, that Saul and the Pity was a kind of uh, maturity achieved too early and then you had to back away from it you know I'm sorry, maturity a, a achieved, achieved, too, achieved early. too early, and you backed away from it. You said, "Well, no, this this is a little too uh, compassionate, accepting, wise." You know, um, I'm, I'm 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 being too humane in a way. You know, because later on you are much more uh, uh, of abrasive, a abrasive, abrasive, provocative. Sarcastic. But this is but this does have to do with the subject matter. I don't think it's the case in sense of loss, but certainly later on it becomes the case. Uh, and this has to do with, uh, I think, with what I was talking about, that, that sarcasm and irony is also a refuge. It's also a way of making statements, and it's also, I mean, uh, perhaps in the early days uh, I was closer to Capra, and in the later days I was, and then nowadays I'm closer to Billy Wilder. I, I, I don't think this means that, I mean, this, oh, let me say one thing. Uh, Only one? On that. Yeah, well, just one. I'm not, uh, the the, the uh, cynicism, uh -huh. cynicism, because we're talking about Billy Wilder. Uh, uh, nowadays, I, when I go on lecture things and, and Students come up, young students come up and say, oh, well, then they make a compliment and they say, oh, well, I really enjoyed this film, you know, November Days. It's really cynical. Hmm. Well, if I, if I ever get around to writing my memoirs, one of the titles will probably be Against Cynicism. Yeah. I've worked against cynicism all my life, whether you think I was more mature before or no, not. No, I don't. But I was, or more quiet or more, more, more humane. But, I think but it was always you. against cynicism. And, and, and the idea that, that the word cynicism can now be used um, as a compliment uh, seems very frightening to me. And uh, one of the nice things about talking here on November, what is it, November 6th? I think there was a, an article in the New York, an editorial in the New York Times this morning, The End of Cynicism. Mm -hmm. I think yes, that, right. The I think that uh, I'm yeah. very happy about the way this sense. election came out because yes, those 12 years, yeah. or were they 16? 12. Of, <laughs> of, 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 of Reagan, Thatcher, Bush, Bush the trickle-down cynicism. We've had trickle-down cynicism, and this is one of the th reasons why why I've had trouble working. I take this very personally, <laughs> uh -huh. because how can you look at documentaries about good guys, bad guys, subtleties, uh, uh, moral dimensions, moral decision-making, when you are constantly bucking the fact that, that the leaders of the society tell you that there is no such thing, that there's family values, but no other values, no real values. Mm -hmm. and, and, and all this hypocrisy, all this cynicism. You can't buck these things, even if you do try to be a resistance fighting in film. So the rooftops, for instance, at, mm -hmm. at Japan. Um, was, it, was it a different experience for you to be doing so much on the, on the spot filming as a kind of, almost like a war correspondent or something? Um, what was that like? Well, uh, more, uh, more interesting in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, not as comfortable, for one thing. Uh, it was a, it was a rather dangerous time in Belfast, uh, the Europa Hotel, where we would watch BBC in the evening and play poker, 
had bomb alerts every couple of days. Um, so yes, it was more of a, a mild sort of war correspondent situation. Uh, but the, the, the real difficulty wasn't so much uh, danger, it was, it was the fact that, that I think people, if, if you try to construct films on, on what people tell you about themselves and about their surroundings, uh, it's, they, they, they are more reflective and more interesting if, they, if, if, if they're not in a crisis situation. If they can, uh, a crisis situation, uh, that kind of ethnic conflict as we are now having in and Yugoslavia, Oslo, in Yugoslavia yeah. where, used to be where I'm going to try to spend Christmas, this Christmas again, <laughs> message from the Queen, Santa Claus, uh, the, uh, is, 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 it's more, uh, people are more likely to talk in cliches. This one fellow we saw, also the Northern Irish have this very interesting lilt, you know, it's mm -hmm. a very pleasant, uh, yes. pleasant lilt, but it's sort of like a lullaby. It tends to put you to sleep. And, uh, and this, is the, this fellow, who, who is very interesting, who gave a very good interview, I was very tired that day, and was rather strenuous, and it's the, only in, uh, it's the only interview in my life, the only filmed interview that I actually slept through. <laughs> I, I, only, <laughs> I only found out what he'd actually said when I was back in Paris in the editing table. I didn't know what Patrick McArdle had said because he had this uh, lullaby. <laughs> well, the, uh, the it was, turned out to be a good interview. So you see, we don't really need. It. You don't need to be awake when you're doing your job. That's right. But uh, well, it, it must have been a stretch for you in a way because he, um, this is the one film that uh, does not tap into your um, German, French, American roots. You're actually on different different territory, you know. Uh, did, did, right. it, did it feel like I a... I guess it is the only one, yes. Did it feel like a kind of a stretch for you to be involved with, with the Irish? Uh, the obviously, Irish are famous for being great talkers, and yeah. um, uh, I, the faces seem very kind of uh, craggy and raw in this film, you know. It's a very strong... The bad well, they're thing. very likable, I think. They, they, as I said, the, the, I mentioned this earlier, I, I wasn't terribly comfortable about, about being so neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, I, 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 it's, 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 it's a contradiction because I detest propaganda and I certainly would hate people to think that my films are propaganda. Uh, uh, but at the same time they're very subjective and they're very involved. And, uh, and this fine thin line of, of trying to be subjective and personal and involved in the subject matter but not doing propaganda, right. this film was constantly in danger of being too bland because, because you know, bleeding heart liberal feeling for the oppressed. I not having enough of a personal pro point right, of view. That's right. No, no. Yeah, you do have a very a fascinating interview with Bernadette Devlin in it, in which mm. you, it's it's actually the f the first time that you start uh, uh, questioning, going after your kind of your own kind of. Um, uh, left-wing assumptions and saying to her, how can you ask people to make sacrifices when, uh, when you're so far, uh, for some pie-in-the-sky socialism that's so far away, where, the way you put it is, how can you ask people to make sacrifices in the middle of the tunnel when the light is so far away? And of course, she being a good doctrinaire socialist says, we can and we must, or something like that, yeah, you know. Right. Um, but it's the same question that you later ask again and again in, uh, in November days when you asked the people who, who wanted East Germany to remain um, socialist, you say, well, how can you ask them to live for this ideal, you know, when it's so far away? So I think this was the beginning of that sort of questioning of those assumptions. Well, yes, but uh, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, well, you're sort of implying uh, that, that uh, I, I, like Clemenceau said, uh, when, you, when you get older, you become reactionary anyway. I mean, it's, it's well known. Thing and it's probably a cliche and it's not necessary. I don't think true. it's a question of uh, but, age, but, but of, uh, of, of subtlety when you start to think against yourself, you know. Perhaps, but I was never a Marxist. Uh, I, I was, I'm a lifelong uh, social democrat, which is a European term, which means that I'm a lifelong New Dealer. I'm a Roosevelt and Mondes France man. Uh -huh. So uh, I haven't really uh, that's very evolved clear, from that. Yeah, that's very and, clear. And, 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 and therefore I don't, it's not, it's not that. Uh, 
I mean, yes, I'm not as left-wing as I used to be, but, uh, no, but, uh, but I've never been a Marxist, yes. so I've never had to deal with that particular problem within myself because I don't like, I don't like totalitarian ideologies. It's as simple as that. Okay, what about the Fatswala? What's Fatswala doing uh, in Ireland? Uh, what's Fatswala doing in Ireland? Well, first of all, I love Fatswala. Well. And, and, and you know, when you edit a film for six months, it's terrible to use music that you don't like because you have to hear it over and over again, back and forth, back and forth. You have to get so something you can live to, with, yes. Yes, it's on as well. So, uh, also, there's a stage in, 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 in the structuring of the film, since I don't script beforehand, I script afterwards, and I, I do mean script, I, I do it in longhand. I take the transcripts and I recopy sentence by sentence and comma by comma and hesitation to see where I can cut and where it can, where it will cut, and then I take it back to the editing room. And That's this is very slow work, and while I do it, I put records on. And uh, Fitzgerald records and, 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 and the kind of music I like. And, and, and I was in a hotel on Fifth Avenue while I was doing that work. And, uh, and there was this one Fat Swallow record that kept coming back uh, while I was writing out this stuff. And, 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 and it occurred to me that it fitted with, with the rooftops and with the bricks. And I don't know why it fits. It's an Irving Berlin tune, actually. Mm -hmm. Waiting at the end of the road, it's called, and it has a sort of a tinny melancholy. Uh, well, I think I think Fats Waller has great melancholy. Great. Uh, it also has this business of of being black and being oppressed, and, mm -hmm. and and being a sort of a sadness which has to do with 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 being uh, with being cheerful and oppressed at the same time. I think this is part of the greatness of Fats Waller. It's this Mozart quality that he has. Mm, yeah. What about your, uh, I certainly agree with that, what about your whole use of popular music in general and, and popular culture uh, uh, for ironic effect or is it, is it ironic effect? No, it usually is not. It, and I think this is one of, the, one of the things where it's misinterpreted. For instance, uh, uh, like the Maurice Chevalier at the Maurice end. Maurice Chevalier. Very often, people uh, thought that in the song "The Pity," the fact that Maurice. Well, you know, excuse me for interrupting myself here on this. Go ahead. You know that in Annie Hall, yes. uh, uh, at the beginning of Annie Hall, after they've gone and stood in line and seen the song "The Pity," I think for the second or third time, yes. uh, they uh, they lie on on a bed. And uh, uh, this is going to turn into an anti-producer story again. Uh -huh. uh, and they lie on the bed, and and the first thing that uh, that uh, uh, Alvy Singer says to to Diane Keaton to Annie Hall is is before they make love, uh, he says the first thing he says is, "Boy, it, that must have really been heroic to be in the resistance. Imagine having to listen to Maurice Chevalier all day long." <laughs> and 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 when I saw this, when I saw this, when I discovered the film, I thought it was very funny. Of course, I laughed a great deal. I also love Maurice Chevalier. So does Woody Allen. But uh, but I th but then I immediately thought, boy, isn't it wonderful to be Woody Allen? And because surely, surely the producers must have come to him and said, look, this film is to be seen by millions, yeah. and, and how many people know who Maurice Chevalier is, and how many people have seen the song The Pity, so how many people will understand this particular gag? <laughs> uh, it must have been that kind of thing. And, uh, uh, <laughs> and he kept it in. Yeah. And, and he kept it in. Well, this is not elitism. This is the whole name of the game. You understand through context. Whether it's gags or interviews, you create a context, yes. and the whole idea, but producers never understand that. They always think you have to explain things. Uh, through the context, people, because people are not idiots, they, 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 they see that and they immediately understand that this must be somebody who is singing in the film that they have just seen, yeah. and that takes care of it. Uh, excuse me for bringing that up, but yes, uh, 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 indeed, one of the reasons nowadays that we have difficulties in, in, in securing popular music to use in films is that very often other documentary colleagues do use it for sarcastic effect. And uh, Irving Berlin, for instance, uh, 
uh, was very much against this music being used in documentaries because Peter Davis, who's a good friend of mine, used This is the Army to do Hearts, Hearts and Minds about Vietnam. And, and this made uh, Irving Berlin very unhappy. He thought his author's rights were being violated, which I think is more or less true. Uh, I don't do that, usually. No, well, actually, after I saw the song Pity, I went out and bought a Maurice Chevalier record, so yeah, it had the right great. effect, you know. He's, he's a Maurice Chevalier is one of the great entertainers of the 20th century. <laughs> and also, I should add, I don't think, again, I'm very much like my father, I don't think that uh, he worked with Daniel Darieux after the war. He worked with a lot of people who had, who had gone on making films during the occupation. It was never a problem to him. It was not a problem to me because I think that entertainers like engineers or, 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 or uh, soda jerks just go on doing their job. It's not, they don't have to take a political stand. If they collaborate, it's something else. If they go to Germany and shake Goebbels' hand, it's, it's, it's something else. Maurice Chevalier, as far as I know, never did that. Okay. He just kept on singing. Right. right. Um, we're going to move on to the memory of justice, which is a, a, a one of your uh, longest and most ambitious movies. And I think uh, we will just start out with the clip because it's the beginning of the film and I wanted to show how sometimes you you set out symphonically the different strands that you're going to pursue over the course of a film. So if we could get the, um, the clip of Memory of Justice. Tell us what you're doing there, uh, where, you, uh, where you lay out all these different strands. Um, on this film? Yeah. Well, you used the word ambitious a while ago. Um, I, I think in many ways the memory of justice, which was not a successful film, and of course you always have to be very suspicious of filmmakers when they, when they start plugging their unsuccessful films. Uh, uh, but I do think it's a better film than The Song of the Pity, a more interesting, more complex film. But yes, I, I probably bit off more than I could chew. Uh, because because uh, the song the pity is is at, at the core of it is is a very simple it's about courage and courage is very sexy uh, it's a, it's a simple thing it's emotional people latch on to it very quickly this is about justice justice is very abstract it's very difficult to be abstract uh, with film yes. and it's it's an almost desperate enterprise and, and also the idea of, 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 uh, of comparing Nazi crimes to other crimes perpetrated since Nuremberg was, was it, to my mind at that time, unavoidable. You couldn't make a film about Nuremberg without doing that because it would have been uh, dishonest and banal not to do it. But at the same time, uh, the idea that you then might be in danger of equating. Making things, it too easy. Equating. Making it, yes, making, uh, <laughs> providing the Germans with an alibi. And, 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 and also, uh, uh, again, uh, abstraction, not only the danger of abstraction, but the danger of generalization, of saying, well, yes, what after all is the difference between a B-52 pilot dropping bombs and, and, uh, and an SS guard uh, gassing children at Auschwitz. It's all criminal and it's all... This, of course, was very fashionable in the 60s and 70s, yes. this kind of uh, radical chic relativism. So the whole film was an effort to deal with the subject and at the same time not to fall into these traps. Mm. This then led to, as you probably know, to to hiring and firing and getting uh, taking having the control of the film taken away from me and then fighting through law courts to get back into control and and uh, and burglarizing yes the uh, film was uh, the uh, film a, a heroic burglarizing you. actually yeah. by a friend of yours who yes. just brought it back to you yes Anna Carrigan the, the, the Irish girl I was talking about earlier oh. who thought I should do films about the Irish resistance and who then became my friend and assistant on this and she, she actually went and took a slash print and brought it to New York so that I could eventually, two years later, through the help of Paramount and Hamfish and Max Polevsky and other benefactors, get back into control. Um, we are running on late, aren't well, we? Well, I just wanted to... Well, uh, I, 
I, I, I was joking that if uh, since you make four and a half hour yeah. movies, maybe we'll oh. have a four and a half hour interview. But uh, um, I wanted to go on a. a um, well, may I just say one yeah. thing about again about Final Cut and control and why I lost it? You see, the, 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 there was a co-production between uh, 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 British private producers and the BBC, and the British private producer is a man who has become extremely yeah. famous. David Putnam, he's David one of the Putnam. most famous producers. And a uh, very famous producer, he was still a young man then, and we started out being on extremely good terms. He's a very bright fellow, and we got along extremely well. And, and Germany, uh, German television. And the Germans really thought, and I suppose I, you know, sometimes you have to be ambiguous if you want to make films and not tell everything that you think you're going to be doing. Uh, they really thought that looking at the Nuremberg principle the way I've just explained would indeed let their audience off the hook. Yeah and would be appealing to uh, the grandmothers and grandfathers and the people who had been in the Nazi years and who had cheered for Hitler and, and so forth and who thought that the Nuremberg trial was the victors over the vanquished. Mm -hmm. And uh, and denazification and all that stuff. So so they thought they, they thought this relativistic thing would be to the to their advantage and David and, and his partners thought that they would appeal to the radical chic market. Mm -hmm. So they were both on the same side. Yeah. And this is the reason why I lost control of the film and that they fired me on the evening before the final dot. And then when I got back into control and I came back to London, I'm trying to tell this story very fast, but it's an important story. And I came back and somebody, again, some uh, burglar, uh, had, had, had made available to me the transcript of the film that they had recut mm. uh, for the Germans and for the radical chic. And I discovered at two o'clock in the morning while working on, on my own film, I discovered this character you just saw and who has just brought out an extremely interesting book, I understand, on his experiences in Nuremberg, Professor Telford Taylor, yes, who was right. the General Telford Taylor, I used to call him Al Gary Cooper, Mr. He looks, he's, Mr. he's like a he's man. Very handsome man, very, very handsome, handsome man. Mr. Smith goes to the Nuremberg, uh, and, and uh, Mr. Deeds goes to Nuremberg. Yeah. And uh, wonderful man, wonderful man. He was the first man to talk against McCarthy and so forth. Well, okay, he's just published, I'm plugging his book because he's done his memoirs about Nuremberg, they just came out. Okay. So on the on this transcript of the of the of the film where they use my material in their own way, I suddenly find on page three, I suddenly find the following sentence, and I will quote it verbatim. I'm sorry if this takes a little time, but I think it's important when you talk about documentary filmmaking and propaganda. I found Telford, who had become a friend of mine, saying on page three of this other fellow's film, um, the GIs in Vietnam had committed the same crimes and to the same degree as the Nazis we condemned in Nuremberg. Which was very And then it from... went on to show burned hatches and, and uh, the napalm and so forth, and the whole film started with that. I said, but Tafford has never said that. Yes. They must have used an actor. I mean, how could they? I mean, I did the interview. It was a six or seven hour interview. They, they couldn't have done it. So I went home to the hotel and I started looking at the original transcript and it took me an hour or so to find the place. Indeed, they had not used an actor. They had used the place very early in the interview where I talked about the pocketbook edition of his book, Nuremberg and Vietnam, an American Tragedy, which in some ways the film is based on. And very early, when I was still addressing him as professor and not as Telford, and I was trying to break the ice, as one does in this kind of interview, I, I said, well, professor, I've noticed that on the, on the first edition of the Pahim book, there's a swastika superimposed on the American flag. And in later editions, there is, the swastika disappears. Now, why is that? I sort of yeah. anticipated what the answer would be. I wanted him to admit that he was the one who had interfered with the publisher so that the swastika would be removed. And being a lawyer, he sort of, for another two, three pages of transcript, he sort of uh, danced around the thing and finally he said, well, yes, I guess I was the one to remove it. I said, why? Yeah. And he said, because it did seem to imply that. 
And then came the GIs seven. in Vietnam were guilty of the same uh, uh, crimes yeah. and to the same degree as the Nazis we condemned in Nuremberg. And I don't agree with that. Right. Well, that's blurb thinking. They took the one part of the blurb that they wanted and they threw and, away and, the rest. And, and make the whole construction on that. And, and this is, and, and I tell this story as much as I can because, because if we are not, not, we are not paranoid and we're not, uh, we're not necessarily megalomaniac if we want final cut on our work. Because this was a gross betrayal of not only of documentary filmmaking, but of politics, of Telford Taylor. It was a betrayal of his, as a matter of fact, he sued. One of the reasons that I was able to get back into a control is because I told him, Telford, I called him on the telephone the next morning. I said, Telford, I want you to call my lawyer and send, a, send, a, really, uh, send him the power of attorney so that he can sue. Mm. So, David Putnam, yeah, sure. What, what? David Putnam, the head of Columbia Pictures. What? Um you said, you said that this was a, um, uh, a film about the idea of justice. What, what, what do you think justice, why are you so preoccupied with justice? What, what, what do you think, the, what, what are your personal roots that make you so preoccupied with justice? Merchant of Venice, Charlotte, when Jewish, you, being Jewish, I think, I think, I think, I think Jews uh, in this century uh, have, have, have to be preoccupied with justice because because only institutional justice in, in, in free countries and in democracies can keep minorities from being oppressed. It's, it's, it's the only way to react to the law of the jungle and, and, and therefore to fascism. Yep. See, but it's, but it's, it's, it's difficult, sure. But you mentioned, you mentioned being Jewish, and this is something that barely comes up in Sorrow and the Pity, comes up in Memory of Justice, comes up even more in Hotel Terminus and in November Days, where, where, where you emerge much more as a, uh, as a character in the movies and where you tell many of the people you're interviewing, I am Jewish. Uh, you know, you confront them and say, especially this neo-Nazi character, you say, no, I'm I, Jewish. I, 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 I hope I haven't been overdoing it. I think no. I did it once in, in November days, yes. But, uh, did I do it in other times? Definitely in, uh, in Hotel Terminus. Um, it seems as though there's, there's much more of an, of an interest on your part in, in, in asserting that, that uh, mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is we are uh, documentary filmmaking is non-fiction filmmaking. You have to deal with reality, and you have to ch deal with changing reality. And and at the time of the Song of the Pity, we thought we had won the war. We, I don't mean the Jews. I mean the people were, I mean Anthony Eden and Winston Churchill and Roosevelt and the Anglo-Saxon and Norman the Normandy Landing and the GIs. And we thought we had won the war, and that includes the Jews. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, did we? It's still being fought. Because of the rise of anti-Semitism? Racism in general, and, and ethnic Racism. cleansing, and, 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 uh, and, and people seeking their, to find their identity in, collectiv in collectivism, in all forms of collectivism, and, 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 um, and, and, and throwing out whatever is strange to them because they're scared, and, and all the all the things that we thought we had sort of settled in that great big anti-Hitler war with Muslim. And, and the Song of the Pity still, still works. When I said it, it's, it's a Western. I meant that, 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 that the good guys and the bad guys were clearly defined on those lines at that time. And now, uh, because, because, uh, uh, because the anti-Semites are no longer on the defensive, because they're quite open, uh, therefore, uh, if if you have to deal with these problems, then uh, it's uh, then at some point you, you you simply have to assert yourself because what would be the alternative? The alternative would be to kiss ass in some way, to 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 give in to them or to to compromise with them. I I, I refuse to compromise with anti-Semitism. No, white anti-Semitism or any other form of anti-Semitism. I don't want to compromise with it anymore. I've been, I've been in this game too long. You, uh, I just can I probe this a moment longer? Um, sure. Your your mother was was not Jewish, so you no. actually, according to the Grand Rabbi of Israel, are not Jewish. No, no. 
uh, but but you you um, you uh, um, feel yourself uh, as a Jew, uh, and um, does this include uh, religious observance, or is no. it more kind of um, no. identification on another level? No, it's 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 the century we live in. You, you remember about Charlie Chaplin, who was who didn't really know who his father was, and who was always thought of as Jewish because, again, because he was left wing and because he was a libertarian, and 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 and, and because he, uh, oh, and uh, and uh, after, at one time he was asked, well. Why don't you when you why don't you say when you're being asked why don't you say that you're not a Jew? And he said because this would be anti-Semitism. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, the times we live in uh, show very clearly. Also, we are now becoming aware. I don't know if this is the case so much in the United States. It certainly is the case in Europe that uh, that anti-Semitism is the most um, profound and the most mysterious and the most incurable and stubborn form of racism because uh, as compared for instance to being anti-Arab or, 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 or anti-black or, because, uh, because there's so much envy involved the uh, the uh, most most racism is based on 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 uh, intolerance and contempt, and in the case of anti-Semitism, at least this is the case I think in, in in Europe where it's where it's growing again, it does have to do a lot with anti-intellectualism, anti-rationalism, and just plain envy. This whole idea that there's a Jewish conspiracy because we take all the you know, we control the media and the Jewish lobby and, and all of these things that in the Weimar Republic the Nazis worked on, they're working on it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you better say, yes, I am the Jewish lobby. You're talking to the Jewish lobby. Now what are you going to do about it? <laughs> okay, just good to know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, f you mentioned that uh, this movie is... Um, uh, not as simple as an idea uh, as in The Sorrow and the Pity and, and it makes me think of the difficulty of, of thinking uh, via cinematic images in general, how one, how one thinks in the sense that an essayist does but not, not, not writing but using a movie camera. How does, how does, how does thought work through a movie? You know? um, this must be both a, uh, something that you've tried very often to do. You were mentioning in, in the sense of loss how you felt you, you, you didn't quite impose enough of a point of view on it, you know. Um, so, uh, it's a rather abstract question. I don't, I don't know if I can address it directly. Uh, what it does make me think of is, and, and perhaps this is an alibi, because they're certainly talking heads pictures and they're very talkative pictures. Uh, uh, but it reminds me of, of uh, always of Orson Welles, who is rightly considered to be one of the most visual directors in, in screen history. Aside from being one of the greatest, he's certainly one of the most visual. And he, when, whenever he was asked about about what comes first, he always said the word. Mm -hmm. He was very very stubborn about that. And he always he always said, "It's we are part of the verbal literary tradition, mm -hmm. the literary theater tradition. And once once you you leave that, then you go into the area of video clips." Mm -hmm. And uh, I switch off. I go to the straight to the cemetery. I have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. I don't want it. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's an answer. Well, he is someone actually toward the end of his life who started making films that were like personal essays. He made a film about the making of Othello. Oh, sure. Uh, and he, 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 he said he read Montaigne every day. And, mm -hmm. you know, he was very interested in this idea of how do you, how do you get your thoughts across. And I think for, for most documentarians, this is a big question. Do you want to get your thoughts across? How do you get your thoughts across? This very same David Putnam uh, accused you at one time of uh, 
the Memory of Justice, he said, was a personal essay, uh, which I think I is didn't a, even know that. Yeah, he, he it said... Was that mild about it? He said it was a personal <laughs> essay, and... and which Usually I can, he said I was crazy and, and, totally, and totally incoherent. He complained that it was a personal essay, yeah. and, and, uh, which I think is a great compliment. Yeah, it is. And, and you said... Uh, that's like telling a tap dancer he should take the metal edges off oh, his right. shoes uh, <laughs> because they make an unpleasant noise. Uh, <laughs> implying that you can't not make a personal film in a certain way. Well, that's what you do. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, so this whole question of how, to, how does one think and how does one make a personal vision in, through documentary, I think, is a, I just wanted to introduce Well, the it. only discipline that you have, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, and, and, and we don't want it because this is getting over too long, uh, is that, is that the, it is a discipline to, to wait for things to come to you mm -hmm. and not force them and not, because the safe way of doing it is to try to, to apprehend it in advance, and 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 so so what people often think is just excuse me fucking off on my part, the fact that I'm rather passive and wait for things to, uh, and, and 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 therefore people think well he's just using an alibi to 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 sleep late in the morning, uh, <laughs> but, but it is and it is a discipline and it it, it is uh, and it does impose its own rules and I think. Uh, I think that if you if you if you work that out by trial and error, then the problem of what is visual and what is not visual will will uh, settle itself. Because uh, what, after all, is more visual uh, than somebody uh, in 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 close up who hesitates because he's about to start lying his head off. And, and you can see it on the screen. Yes, uh, that's very visual. I think one of the ways that you think that you think through things is in your movies is by uh, setting up a prism of characters, all of whom reflect against each other. You know, Telford Taylor. Uh, everyone's always trying to nominate the hero of each of your films. Some people say Pierre Mendes Francis, the hero of Sorrow and the Pity. In this case, uh, Telford Taylor certainly is. Um, he is a hero. Is he the, um, the, uh, the, the leading boy. man? Yes, he's the wasp. Who stands up for for justice in the century of the final solution? Yeah. He is he is to me the epitome. Yes, Gary Cooper, the people, the the, the the white male American Protestant who saved the world. Right. We should still continue to be grateful. To be them. grateful. Well, yes. In addition, there there are these other people who went away, uh, bang up against him. There's Daniel Ellsberg. There's Albert Speer. Uh, there's Lord Shawcross, to name a few, and and one one of uh, somebody who wrote an article about this film, Colin Westerbeck, uh, said that you were using these people as kind of, he said this very flatteringly. He said you were using them as doppelgangers or doubles for Telford Taylor. That they were all kind of like, um, it's almost like the way a dramatist takes parts of his personality and distributes it to different characters. You know, um, in the case of Ellsberg, for instance, who was much more um, part of the radical chic. Uh, uh, to me, he comes across uh, as a schmuck, basically, because he's he's pushing too hard and he can't see Telford Taylor's point of view at all. He's he's much more rigid than Telford Taylor in a sense. Um, do you think that's unfair to say to to characterize him that way? Well, he would consider it unfair <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but I remember when the film was shown at the New York Film Festival, he was sitting next to me at the panel after the New York Film Festival, and I was scared shit because I thought he would have the same reaction that you just mentioned, uh -huh. and that he would uh, that he would uh, say that he was being badly uh, that he came off badly in the film. And, and, and what he actually said, and, and I remember this because I thought it was rather flattering, he said, uh, well, uh, Ophels, he was sitting right next to me, Ophels only used about one-fifteenth of what I actually said in the film, but, uh, and I know that we don't agree, and certainly the film shows that we don't agree, but I must say that what he did use exactly reflects my views. They are my views, and and and, and uh, even in that very shortened form, he did not betray my thought. This is this is what he said, and uh, so I sort of like him, naturally. Because <laughs> <laughs> do you think? Do you think? Do you think of all the people in in a film like Memory of Justice as somehow uh, having a kind of family connection to each other that they? 
they have certain kind of overlapping sides to them and that they're all made of a kind of... The, the different films? Uh, let's say just within one film. You know, the different characters within one film. Um, that, they, that, that in a way you're Do they relate to each other yes. even though they don't... They yeah. never meet each other. Yes. Well, I think this is this is uh, this is certainly something that I try to achieve in the editing room is the illusion of of their being connected to each other through whatever they lived through or whatever whatever conflicts they were involved in, which relate which makes them relate to each other. So they become characters. And, and of course, the whole business of, of what theater is all about is, is characters relating to each other. And in this case, there are very often people who don't know each other and they were not at the, on the stage at the same time. So you create the illusion and this is what the editing tries to do. It what sometimes about, succeeds. What about this idea that Yehudi Menuhin, the violinist, has that we're all guilty if you're human, you're guilty? No, do you, I don't believe that. You don't believe that? No. No, no. I, 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 I think it's again. I think it's a sort of a, well. Uh, Menuhin is very much influenced by Hindu philosophy, and and uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I go straight for the Ten Commandments. I'm in the Judeo-Christian tradition, but I think he's a great guy. I think he says some very interesting things. Also, he's in the film because he was the first Jewish artist to go to Germany after the war. Mm -hmm. which was a very gutsy thing to do at that time because, I mean, Yasha Heifetz and some of the others have never forgiven him for it, yeah, even it's, now. It's and I thought it was a very nice and very good thing to do. It's Sorry. a point that's made in the film uh, by someone else that your father was one of the, the, uh, the few Jewish artists who continued to love German culture and that's to speak right. out for German culture. The that's fact right. that the Nazis didn't. He did, take did away. not like the bombing of Dresden. He did not think that this was a good way to win the war. Yeah, that's one of the, most the people That's one of the uh, best. Uh, for me, one of the most moving sequences in the memory of justice is the sequence about the bombing of Dresden, mm. uh, because it raises all these complicated questions of, you know, how far can we extend the Nuremberg, and that's right. what what conclusion did you come to about um, the it's a war crime. the applicability of the Nuremberg. Oh, um, well, uh, there is no conclusion, but it's obviously, I think the film, as a matter of fact, I send a fax today to the new president of Paramount, who is Sherry Lansing, uh, because she's just come in, because it's in the vault of Paramount, that print should never be shown anymore, because it's, it's ragged and it's horrible, and, and, and they've, uh, they've got the negative at Paramount. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's very topical again, because Obviously, the Serbs, uh, the Serbs are committing war crimes, and and uh, and, and Saddam Hussein, and, and there's a lot of people who should. If if the if if the Cold War hadn't interfered, and this is what Telford Taylor explains in the film. If the Cold War hadn't made the United Nations into a um, hapless. Uh, 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 a piece of machinery and, and, and a useless, a useless uh, talking, debating uh, sort of thing. Uh, if the Cold War hadn't taken the teeth out of the United Nations, having an international court to uh, uh, to bring those to judgment who who, who commit uh, crimes against the peace and crimes against humanity is certainly a very civilized idea. I don't know how society can go on living. Without it, I think we should revive Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next uh, film, which is Hotel Terminus. We have two more films to discuss. Um, but uh, while they're queuing that up, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned to me that you might go to Sarajevo and make a film there. Uh, um, this would be a bit, I guess, like the Irish film. You'd be again in, in, um, in the firing line or something. Yes, like that. but only for a couple of days. It's a film I've been wanting to do for a long time because, for one thing, it would be a valedictory film because it would be about my own profession. I want to make a film about about the connection between between what is now known as the media and used to be known just as journalism and uh, and in other words, the witnesses to history, the professional witnesses to history, and 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 uh, history in the making. In other words, I want to do. Uh, a, a film about war correspondence. Mm 
huh. the history of war correspondence in the 20th century. And the, 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 um, the, the coat hanger obviously has to be uh, a situation where they stay at the Holiday Inn and try to find a jeep and, right. and, and, and go out on their job yeah. and play poker at night and the bombs falling and so forth. And then you flash back to David Halberstam and the five o'clock follies at Vietnam yeah. and General Schwarzkopf and the Gulf War and so forth and right back to the charge of the Light Brigade in the 19th century, uh, which was the first great action of the war correspondent denouncing the folly of military action. So it's this whole business about censorship, self-censorship, uh, uh, la société du spectacle, uh, 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 Good, the I was, fakery of... I was worried that you were going to go on the front lines. And, oh, I, I will. Uh, if, if, if they let me go, I haven't found anybody who paid my way yet. But uh, partly because, not, not, not because of political censorship, but because I think that nowadays, uh, the people who control the media are very conscious uh, and very vulnerable about criticism, and they uh, they they criticize others, but they very don't like being. Maybe. They're very defensive. They don't like being criticized at all. Yes. And obviously, this is a subject matter where they would come in for some very very heavy criticism. Uh, this this is a uh, oh, uh, a episode that. Um, is all about uh, how the uh, our own um, troops, uh, I mean, how the American government um, used some of the ex-Nazis, used some of the Nazis rather, and uh, hired them as um, uh, for um, spy duty, uh, and um, completely implicates uh, the American government in in that activity. Um, this episode is like an X-ray of a marriage, of uh, you know, every time he. He's going to say something. His wife comes in and says something that he knows is not is not really subtle enough to deal with a and, question and like not him. in his favor. And not in his favor. Uh, and so he's dying. And he there's a whole kind of body language that comes across uh, in that episode, and which I think of as uh, as uh, something that often happens in your movies, where somebody just in this case he just sinks deeper and deeper into the chair, and uh, all through that part of the movie you have this this uh, interaction between body language and decor. You have a lot of Christmas trees and everything like that. Uh, so this isn't, this isn't really a question, but what, um, just a statement about the body language and the use of decor as, as things that, uh, that enrich uh, the interview. Um, why did you, why did you um, come out with that memory pictures stunt? Uh, uh, this is so oh, different from well, the earlier uh, yeah, Marcel Well, uh, it's, it's, it was a... It's very playful. Yeah. Uh, it's also uh, very, uh, it's black humor, it's, it's, uh, it's sarcasm, it's because the toughest part of the film was what we call the German iceberg. Um, it, was, it was obviously easy to get uh, victims and resistance people talking. And it wasn't all that difficult to get uh, the Americans talking because by that time what was known as the Ryan Report had already come out and and it was already public knowledge, and these poor people were fed to the camera and, and had to talk. They probably had orders. They probably had orders from the CIA in Washington to to open up. You know, at that time. If because, you call that because opening Bobby, up, yeah. <laughs> but because Bobby was already arrested, and so they had to try to justify their actions. But the Germans were awfully difficult to get for the reasons that I act out. And it, uh, as a matter of fact, the way this happened, again, it has, it's total improvisation. The way I had no way of knowing that, that, uh, that Taylor's German wife would be sitting there and ending his stories for him and doing his alibiing for him and interrupting him and his sinking into his chair and getting more and more uncomfortable. This is not mise-en-scene. This is what documentaries are about. And, and, and you have to have the room to let it happen, that's all. Uh, which means that you that you have to shoot a lot. Uh, now the, the the other thing is just frustration, and it's actually anger because it was very cold, and we'd come from Paris, and we at that time the production had very little money, and my German assistant, who's a great friend of mine and who acts out the scene with me, had not lined up the interviews that he was supposed to line uh. up, and I was angry <laughs> at him, I was angry at the crew, I was angry at the production. And I said, okay, well, if that's all we came to Germany to do is to film that goddamn house there where Ger Bobby is supposed to have had his office, then uh, get the camera ready. I have a statement to make. Ah. 
I see. And, and then I, I, I didn't tell him about it and I just said, well, 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 what were you doing yesterday when you were at the airport trying to reach that woman? What did she say to you? And then and that's how we got into it. And, and it's, it's a way of, of doing what a film called All the President's Men does at one point, where, where you do doorbell ringing and then people close the door in your face. It's part of this the, of the of the of the uh, game playing of of investigative journalism mm -hmm. that you try to show to the audience that you don't that you don't bring home the bacon on the first try yes. that you have uh, that uh, that it becomes part of the action trying to bring home the bacon Dustin Hoffman and Robert Redford uh, well, you uh, become ringing a... the doorbells before they get to the Republican committee you know you but you story. you become a character in your own film much more you become a character well because of that. Yeah, um, but I mean, over the course of the different films, you're you're seen more uh, in the foreground interviewing. In fact, I think you are the most famous bald head in film since Yul Brynner. Uh, uh, we see, you know, you you, you you put yourself more into the frame, I think, and that's a that's a that's an interesting development um, because I think you you actually succeed in making a good character out of yourself, somebody who who isn't always patient, you know. In losing your patience, uh, you 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 humanize the, the documentary a great deal. I think. You know. uh, we're going to queue up the next film. Uh, Hotel Terminus is a, is really a masterpiece, and I wish that we had just two hours to talk about it alone. Um, but um, we we've got to. Uh, end you this. notice people are snickering. Now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Want to go okay. home? Okay. So we're going to <laughs> show the last uh, episode, which is from November Days, and recommend highly that you go see Hotel Terminus. I'm very afraid, nasty, very nasty. Very nasty. I'm afraid, it's, I'm afraid we've passed silver time and we're into gold time now. So um, I'd like to thank you for being so generous in uh, submitting to this interrogation. And I'd like to thank the audience for so uh, generously staying with us all this time, those of you who did stay with us. Um, thank you very much.